thank Ranking Member Kennedy, my friend, for his remarks. And I turn now to our first witness, uh, Lisa Graves, who is appearing um, electronically with us, assuming that our electronic team can bring her to life on these screens. Uh, her full testimony, which is really quite thorough and impressive, will be made a part of the record. And she has seven minutes for a summary of it. Thank you. Ms. Graves. Thank you for the uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Whitehouse. Thank you for the invitation to testify, uh, Chairman, Ranking Member Kennedy, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Lisa Graves, and I'm the president of the Center for Media and Democracy, a nationally recognized watchdog group. I also help lead a number of historical research projects like Alec Exposed, Bold Rethink, and Coke Docs about oil billionaire Charles Koch. Our democracy is facing a trio of extraordinary challenges right now. There's a deadly pandemic that some refuse to take seriously, even as it ravages families, communities, and our economy. There's a lucrative monetization of poisonous lies about our election. And there's a calamity of dark money that is super amplifying the voices of the super rich and corroding the integrity of our court system. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you about that calamity in our courts. I first began earnestly studying America's judiciary more than 30 years ago, and I've devoted much of my career to trying to protect fair courts for all. I served as a senior advisor in all three branches of the federal government, where I focused largely on the judicial appointment process. I have a deep reverence for the vital role a truly independent and fair judiciary plays in a healthy republic to ensure both that the laws adopted by those we elect to represent us are fairly applied and that the sacred promises of our Constitution are faithfully kept. I've been keenly focused on the judiciary because for most of American's history, the Supreme Court failed to play that role, despite what we were taught in middle school. The court had terribly failed black Americans, indigenous tribes, millions of workers of all races and ethnicities, generations of women, brave conscientious objectors, and those imprisoned though they had done nothing wrong like Fred Korematsu. But after World War II, the Supreme Court finally had a complement of genuinely independent justices with the courage to insist that equal protection of the laws in our Constitution meant what it said for black school children eager to learn in Topeka, that freedom of speech applied not just to the powerful, but also to white kids passionate for peace in Des Moines, and that the right to counsel meant exactly what it said for the impoverished Clarence Gideon and so much more. But the backlash against those landmark rulings that finally enforced the human rights of ordinary Americans was swift, and it has endured and expanded adding grievances by elite CEOs who object to the rights of workers to form unions and who consider laws limiting the ways industries can harm our only planet to infringe on their liberty. There's a through line from the regressive forces who sought to impeach Chief Justice Earl Warren to Richard Nixon's cynical invocation of law and order, all the way through to the free market fundamentalists peddling legal and policy arguments about limited government as a cloak for limited democracy. But the secret cash involving involved in trying to catch the court, capture the court nowadays is massive. The impulse to use tradition as a weapon and the temptation to use storehouses of money as secret power supercharged by social media has been turned into a multi-million dollar industry trying to capture our courts and turn back the clock. As a result, our nation's highest court is engulfed in dark money. Over the past decade, special interests have pumped hundreds of millions of dollars into sophisticated campaigns to influence judicial nominations, judicial decisions, and judges themselves through a dizzying array of dark money nonprofits and limited liability corporations. As CMD's executive director, Arne Pearson, has noted, that tsunami of cash is not a positive sign of civic engagement. It is an exercise in raw power. The Supreme Court will issue rulings about whether we can access affordable health care to lengthen our lives, if we can protect our right to vote from officials determined to suppress it through simple-minded or sophisticated tactics, if we can regulate carbon and secure a more livable planet, and even if we can limit corruption by disclosing the wealthy, wealthy interest trying to buy results. As a federal society leader, Leonard Leo told right-wing donors at the Council on National Policy, quote, judicial confirmations these days are more like political campaigns, he said. To which I say, then let's treat them that way, by regulating, regulating them as such, as the chairman has proposed. I think the process for choosing judges and the techniques for influencing their rulings need, need even greater transparency because judges are supposed to be fair and they're appointed to jobs for life. Some will argue that there are far larger empires of dark money on the left. And while we disagree, that argument has no bearing on the merits of the reforms that are coming before this Senate. That the proposed disclosure rules would apply regardless of the point of view or the interest of those influencing the judiciary. 
Nevertheless, I must emphasize that there is simply no evidence that there was anyone on the left playing the kind of singular role Leonard Leo has played in the selection of Supreme Court and lower court judges, the marshalling of resources to secure their confirmation, and the role he and his major donors have played in unleashing the flotilla of amicus briefs the chairman spoke about last October. As Bob O'Hare and Sean Boberg of the Washington Post have documented, Leo has boasted to his donors that due to those appointments, America stands at the precipice of what he calls a revival of this, quote, structural constitution, hearkening back to before the New Deal, back to the robber baron era. The Washington Post estimated the combined revenue of the dark money groups in Leo's judicial influence network um, to be $250 million between the years 2014 and 2017. That was before the Brett Kavanaugh nomination. When 2018 tax filings are added into that tally, along with new Leo-connected entities, the total reaches more than $400 million. That doesn't include the spending after Barrett's nomination or by coke control groups or other groups. During this period, Leo's assets appeared to increase, allowing him to pay off his home mortgage years and years ahead of schedule and close on a mansion in Maine, literally on the day the Senate voted to invoke cloture on Kavanaugh's nomination. The Federal Society filings show he took a significant pay cut to spend time, quote, volunteering, to help judges, Trump choose judges, but he was not required by law to file any White, House, any White House financial disclosure forms. What are the results? Five of the current justices of the Supreme Court are former Federal Society members or frequent flyers, and 86% of the appellate judges appointed by Trump were members. Just as judicial appointments have become a de facto political campaign, getting a case heard by the Supreme Court and submitting coordinated amicus briefs has become a de facto form of lobbying. The number of amicus briefs before the court has soared in recent years, as the National Journal found, saying, uh, saying that justice decided those briefs in 65% of the cases last term. In preparation for this hearing, the Center for Media Democracy examined a sample of amicus brief, briefs <clears throat> pardon me, in five cases. By searching tax records, our researchers found that between 2015 and 2019, a total of $116 million was donated by just 12 funding vehicles to 18 repeat player groups that filed amicus briefs in three or more of those cases. 40 million of that came from three right-wing donor advised funds, Donors Trust, Donors Capital Fund, and Bradley Impact Fund. Another 47 million came from Coke-related entities. I'm telling you that it's well past time for there to be mandatory disclosure of the major donors of those effectively lobbying the Supreme Court. Finally, the lack of a binding code of conduct for the Supreme Court means our highest court has the lowest binding ethical standards, none. In my written statement, I detail a truly shocking array of very troubling problems relating to conflicts of interest, disclosure of outside family income, gifts, junkets, and more. Many of these anecdotes unfortunately involve Justice Clarence Thomas and his wife, Ginny. In American democracy at its best, we have a right to expect judges to be fair and not favor powerful corporations or special interests, as those moneyed interests play an increasing role in, in appointments, amicus briefs, and other means of influence. The integrity or trustworthiness of judicial decisions is essential to having a system of justice worthy of respect and deference. These are some of the reasons why the Center for Media Democracy strongly supports crucial reforms like those contained in the For the People Act, the Disclose Act, the Amicus Act, and the Judicial Travel Accountability Act. Thank you for considering our views. Thank you, Ms. Graves. Thank you, Ms. Graves. Before we conclude, um, I want to um, give both uh, Ms. Graves and Mr. Jealous a chance to comment on what uh, Mr. Walter has said in his testimony about their organizations. He mentions each of their organizations specifically, and I think it would be fair for them to have the chance to reply um, whether his comparisons you believe to be well-founded. Let me start with um, Ms. Graves. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. You know, I think that there's uh, a lot I disagree with in the statement by Mr. Walter, and I disagree with the characterization of uh, the funding that CMD has received. I think that what Congress has done uh, in H.R. 1 uh, is draw some very important lines. For example, um, if groups are spending $10,000 to influence a judicial nomination, they would need to disclose all donors who gave $10,000 or more. I think those are good and they're low thresholds, but they're, you know, significant thresholds. And that is the type of thing that, you know, uh, does not apply to the work that the center does. But also I think that, you know, the important thing from my perspective is that what I've said on behalf of the Center for Media Democracy and on behalf of uh, others uh, 
you know, others out there who are concerned about this is that it doesn't matter whether Scott Walter is right or wrong. I think he is incorrect in numerous ways. But what matters is that um, if we had this disclosure, we would all know definitively the answers to those questions. And as Senator Hirono said, quite frankly, the only uh, members of Congress who are supporting uh, this kind of disclosure uh, in H.R. 1, in the Disclose Act, in, in the travel bill that you propose, are Democrats. And that's a shame because, quite frankly, this should not be a partisan issue. Everyone should be in favor of this kind of transparency. And the effort to try to command that a particular group, uh, like uh, uh, People for the American Way, uh, on instantly disclose their donors when, when there's not the same parity, um, you know, is sort of a, a, a way to have a show, but not to actually do anything to embrace and support laws that would level the playing field for everyone. And so the Center for Media Democracy favors the measures that you've supported because they would apply to all the groups equally who engage in that activity. Um, I also would say, Senator, um, that uh, as, a, as a granddaughter of an immigrant who fled not one but two communist revolutions, I take personal issue with Senator Cruz's efforts to cast uh, a smear across progressive funders by calling them socialist or implicitly communist. It's um, uh, not uh, the type of smear that I think we should tolerate in Congress. Um.